law order, what it does is that it kills the spirit. Hallelujah. Right? It, what it does is that it hinders and the way he wants to function. So we see here again, the angel reach about the time of the evening offering. And give him the message. Then there was a man of prayer praying three times a day. Right? The angel could have reached him at any moment. Right? At any season. But the angel chose to appear to him again here. We see at a specific time. <laughs> On the day of Pentecost. As the evening offering. Come on, that, that should tell you something about offering. You know, you know, if if you're gonna collect an offering, you know, hey, don't let the basket go by empty. Amen. Come on, why? Imagine, right? Why? Because God takes such important attention to how we respond. Okay, it's not about your finance; it's about your heart. Why? Because you know, you just say, God, I love you all. Offering goes by, you don't even have a dime. Ouch. Come on. Yesterday was my, my second daughter. She turned 15. 15. And, you know, we were spending all, all day with her. And as we took her out, I told her, I said, we're going to go to the mall to buy some stuff. I said, you want something? You just look at it and you just tell me, Daddy, I like it. I said, you just walk away. Don't worry about it. I'll buy it. <coughs> Why? It's my child. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I have a privilege to bless her. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. I want her to know that, hey, you like it? Your daddy's got it covered. Don't worry about it. You see, my younger daughter is very, you know, she's, she's a very intellectual kid. And she's like, Dad, this is too expensive. I said, no, you need it? Got it. Amen. That's not your problem. That's my problem. You don't have to worry about the budget. I have to worry about the budget. Right. <laughs> Are you with me? When you get married and you have children, you worry about the budget. Yeah. <laughs> but now <clears throat> you just look and say, Daddy, I like it. Done. <laughs> Daddy will take care of it. Hallelujah. Isn't our heavenly father like that? Same way. Same way. Exact same way. Exact same way. The Bible says, even before you ask or think, can you imagine? You haven't even thought about it, he's already done. But we come to him and oh God, please, don't pass me by. How? That's not his character. That's not his nature. So he says here, at the time of the evening offering. Okay, so God, God has a pattern here. There's a pattern. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, he says, no. The boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and there was no widespread revelation. It came to pass at the time while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. Before the what is this verse three? And before the Lamb of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark was. And while Samuel was lying down, the Lord called Samuel. Amen. Again, again, what do we see? Again, we see timing. Why? Because you remember in the Old Testament, that fire cannot go out. Right. Okay? That fire had to be kept going. It was an ordinary fire. It was a fire that came from God. You with me? The fire inside the tabernacle. That fire had to keep going. 
emotional. It's good. Again. Again, what do we see? We see timing. There's a timing. There's a timing. There's a, there's a pattern here. Right? Good. There's a special day. There's a prophetic calendar. There's an evening time. Okay? Of offering. There's an hour of incense. That's what we see here. Okay? How does God timeline flow? Okay? Notice that it flows also in cycles. We can see this in Matthew chapter 1. Okay? If you want to fall asleep, just read Matthew chapter 1. <laughs> Especially at the beginning. All the summers. Right? But verse 17 says, from the generation from Abraham to David was 14 generation. From David until the captivity of Babylon was 14 generation. And the captivity of Babylon until Christ was 14 generation. <coughs> Again, what do we see? We see a pattern. Not 12 generation, 11, 10, 14, 14, 14. Okay? 14 is 6, 7. Your cycles. Right? The six sevens there, right there. Right? It's not an accident. Okay? Especially when you look at David until the captivity of Babylon. Babylon, it wasn't it wasn't some believers invasion, it was an unbelievers invasion. <laughs> Heathen invasion. And say 14 generations the Babylonians in walking. The world may not believe in Jesus, in Jesus, may not believe in God, but listen, they are stuck with his time God. <laughs> stuck with it. You know that? You know that the Muslims have a different time calendar? I think they are like, I think 15, 16. Or, go write that when you go to school. See your teacher throw you out of school. Go write it on the top. 1539. Come on. It's the Lord. Hallelujah. See, they don't believe Jesus. Well, you follow his calendar. BC and AD. Come on. It's not BM and AM. <laughs> it's not BB. Come on. It's not after Buddha. Or before Buddha. It's not after Muhammad or before Muhammad. It's after Christ. Why? Because he is time itself. Hallelujah. He is time. He is the beginning. The Bible says and the end. The Alpha and the Omega. That's why when you get connected to him, you are connected to eternity. God removes you from being ordinary and makes you extraordinary. Because now you're connected with him. You're connected with time itself. Hallelujah. That's so bad. I, I pray you catch it. Catch it. Why? Because we got we got too many people walking around missing the point. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what happens. Everything that's alive happens is all for one reason. Especially you as a believer. Why? Because he is pushing you to his presence. He's pushing you to his purpose. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you here tonight? Yes. 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 It's, a, 
There's a pattern. There's a cycle. We see in Genesis chapter 15. Then God said to Abraham. Now certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not the us. And will serve them and they will be afflicted. Afflict them for 400 years. Verse 16. But in the fourth generation they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. You build the altars now, and I let your children claim it. Think about it. Abraham is offering an altar. You know, uh, you know, he's worshiping God, and God is telling him, Your children, for 400 years, they will be in slavery, they will be in bondage. Listen, the children are not even born yet. I know it. Not even born. And they are not even in existence. They are not even in liquid form. They're somewhere in gas form. Can you imagine? God is saying, listen, they will come. They will be born. 400 years. They will be wounded. But when they come back, you will measure the land. You measure what? Because what you measure, they will possess. Oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. <clears throat> what you measure, they will possess. Yes. Come on. Right. Listen. I, you know. That's good. Boy. I don't care about a country going down in another generation. Why? Because we had no control over it. Do you have control over it? No! But right now, it's our time. Come on! It's our time! In our time, it's not going down! One of the things that we do, okay, which is our, you know, every earthly parent's desire, is to give the next generation a better future than what we have. Isn't that true? Absolutely! Absolutely! Right? It's good to say amen, you know? God, God doesn't understand head checking. And he doesn't. Really, I honestly tell you. If you, you know, one of the powerful things about amen is that when you say amen, you are agree. But if you just, if you just sit there, if you just sit there, it will be like, it will just go past you. And you go back home and don't know what was said. And you will miss that moment. Hallelujah. You don't have to shout it, but you just have to come with agreement. Amen. That's it. Hallelujah. Amen. That promise is mine. Hallelujah. That breakthrough is mine. Amen. Because you see, you see the way you see the way God works? He likes participation. He likes participation. He, he, he doesn't work okay, from the standpoint of people who observe. He likes people to participate. Right. He responds to people who participate. Amen. So tonight, okay, I know we are tired, okay, but let's participate. Yeah. Hallelujah. Right? So it says in verse 16, but in the fourth generation they shall return. What is that? In the fourth generation they shall return. Not third, not second, not first, fourth. Oh, I Imagine the third generation trying hard, man. I want to go back. I want to go back. No, you can't. Don't bother Just chill out. You ain't going anywhere. No matter what you do, you ain't going anywhere. Why? Your third generation. Can you imagine? I mean, I wish, I wish they knew this secret. Why? Because if they knew the secret, you know what they would have done? When it got closer to the fourth generation, you know what they would tell them? Okay, kids, get ready. Okay, kids, get ready. This is the generation. 
of Egypt. They did. They did. Look at the tabernacle. That thing wasn't cheap. God. Can you imagine having one big chunk of gold beating something into shape? I've never seen gold like that in my life. Yeah. It was right there. God told them it's theirs. Recently I was watching this documentary. You know, I felt so sad. Okay? It was a documentary right off West Africa. You know, and off the coast of West Africa, some fishermen were fishing and they found this little piece of jewelry like gold. They found it and, and, and the scientific community realized that this was part of a, a bigger portion of gold that was actually sunk in those waters. Cut a long story short, they came out there and they discovered massive amount of gold like never seen before. You know what's the saddest part? It was one mile from that village. One mile. The entire village was surviving on fishing. <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> one mile jumping. <laughs> Can you believe I'm in huge pieces of pure gold? <laughs> Can you imagine? I just need a tuna. <laughs> Can you imagine when those guys brought all those treasure up? There were generations of people living at that shore that missed the greatest treasure. One mile. One mile. people miss what God has because they don't look at his promise because they fail to comprehend his ability they fail to understand his greatness if you do We will not be where we should. Hallelujah. Let's expand our capacity. Let's increase our ability. Why? Because our God is the God of heaven and earth. He works not on the basis of who you are. He works on the basis of who he is. Who you are is immaterial. Right. Who he is is the foundation. Right. Hallelujah. That's why you can wake up in the morning, no matter how you feel, you can wake up and say, God, thank you. All right. <laughs> I can't even imagine what you're going to surprise me with today. <laughs> and the only thing you can say is, Lord, please go easy. <laughs> Hallelujah. We need, to, we need to change our thinking. We need to change our mindset. Luke chapter 2, verse 25, 26. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name is Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26. Now it has been revealed to, to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. Imagine, he received a word. He probably received a word from God when he was a young man. Maybe he was 20 years old when God gave him that word. You will not die until you see Christ. Can you imagine? Right? Waiting his whole life for one event. Okay? But the event is kind of, <clears throat> I think it's humorous. Why? Because it's circumcision. Okay? Circumcision, it's not a grandiose event, it's just a little boy. 
So he had to be there at a precise time. Look at this. This, this I do not know about you, but it kind of scares me. Why? Because Jesus, Jesus, when Jesus was going to show up, he had no clue. It wasn't told to him January 31st, 9 p.m. He will come. He had to be in constant preparation and awareness for that moment. That's good. You know why many people miss God? Because we are casual. We only get desperate. We only get happy for God, okay, based on our emotion. Right. According to heaven's calendar, that does not work. Right. Right. Some countries that I've been to, you know, when I started my ministry, I told the Lord one thing. I said, Lord, I'm not interested in anything except one thing. It's called revival. I'm not interested in revival. I'm interested in the move of God. I go into a city, people don't need to know me. It's not mad at me. But they must know you. By the time I leave, they know you came. That's it, right? So one of the things I knew I had to do was to ensure that I stayed as a shadow. As I went in. But when the move of God came, I remember this one city where there were 1,000 young people. There was this guy who came and testified at the end. He said, he was angry that he was standing in this meeting. All of a sudden a ball of fire came through the roof and hit it. He flew 20 feet. He ran up to me at the end. He says, I have never seen anything like it. You know, I regret praying that prayer. I said, what prayer did you pray? I shouted out to God, show yourself. I said, I'm glad he killed you. It was a massive visitation of God. It was so phenomenal. I'm not kidding. It was a communist country. But... The kids were set on fire. Literally set on fire. Yeah. And, when, when, and when that move of God hit that meeting, there were 55 churches that were born. Wow. 55 churches came out of the move of God. I don't, even, I don't even know how many hundreds went into ministry. I probably will find out when I go to heaven. But... You know, I don't care too much about that. Why? Because to God be the glory. When a visitation comes, listen, it shifts the whole city. It shifts. Hallelujah. When I became a believer in my own country, I remember we had only 4% Christian. 4%. But that 4% Christian in the 70s, was so different. Why? Because we were crazy for Jesus. Crazy. When I became a youth leader in my church, you know when my youth met? My youth met from Friday 10 p.m. until next morning 6. That was my youth meeting. <laughs> Today's youth won't even come. Right. Listen, they'll be like, man! You're crazy. Over that meeting. I said, yeah, every week. But you know what happened? Let me tell you that. That was not just me. It was all over the city. People are nuts. Today, one out of every four in my country is Christian. One out of every four is Christian. When the government wanted to legalize abortion, I mean legalize, sorry, homosexuality, the Christian leaders wrote to the government and they said, 
Don't touch that. You touch that, we will vote you out of power. We will vote you out of power. Why? Because that may work for the West, it doesn't work here. Because our Bible says, one man, one woman. Are you following me? The Bible does not say, John and Steve. Are you with me? Listen, we don't care what your philosophy is. This is our belief. Right. Are you following me? Yes. Listen. We must understand how God works. He has already done his part. He has already positioned things in place so that when we get into his program, things will work. Listen, I won't even try to preach this message at most churches in America. I won't even try. <laughs> Why? Because most churches, this will be too hard. That's why. That's why they are in a state where they are at. Because they just want God to do his part. But they do not want to do the other part. We got to do our part. Think about it. John chapter 6, verse 16. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. They recognized, look at that. They recognized the Sabbath, but they did not recognize the Lord of the Sabbath. <laughs> right? It says what they did. They did not believe concerning him. They had cast him aside.
Well, come on, you're screaming. Oh, yeah, that World Series champion. Daddy, but you're broke. <laughs> you, bought, you just bought a stupid t shirt made in China, cost you 80 bucks. <laughs> So for three bucks. They go to church! Listen! They go to church! Oh, just another meeting. Just another meeting. I don't, I don't feel like lifting my hands. I don't feel like yeah, I'm here. Come on! Let's press in! thousand people, she wouldn't have put up with this. Are you with me? Yeah. She wouldn't have come here and say, come on guys, come on. <laughs> Ask 
Australia's always talking to me about California. <laughs> Listen, if we are going to see God's visitation, we must increase our temperature. Our expectation of our seeing. We cannot have this attitude coming to church for church to take us somewhere. We must come into the sanctuary. Why? Because we want to be part of what God's going to do. Come on. There you go. You see, God is in the business not raising spectators, He's looking for champions. Imagine. You know, imagine if an Olympic runner goes to the race and says, Man, man, I'm, I'm already at the race and you know I didn't prepare. <laughs> you know what? He won't even be there. Why? Because in the Olympics or any other race, you gotta have minimum requirement. They will check your speed. Why? Because they don't want to race. You got five guys running, and one guy looks like he's walking. <laughs> you don't know. They have to pay hundreds to just watch that race. So they make sure that they score a qualifying timing. You know, in the church, we don't have qualifying timing. I wish we did. I do too. <laughs> do you know John Wesley did? Whoa! That's why the Methodist movement, when it started exploding, it made such an impact. Because when they came in, they had to go through a list of things that they had done before they came in. Amen. Amen. You know what's our problem? We bring people to church, and by the time they come Sunday or Wednesday, they are on recovery mode. So our whole goal is by Sunday service, we have given them enough drugs to survive another week. And yet we stand up here and we say, let's change the world. <laughs> you know what we are shouting that? The angels are probably looking at Jesus like. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they're thinking? Oh, you sure? You didn't want to use to use those guys. <laughs> we got wings, man. Yeah, we can do it. Using those guys. You know what's the worst meeting in church? It's called prayer meeting. When someone tells me, you know, we want you to preach a prayer meeting, I'm like, are you kidding me? One time, there was one large church invited me to come and preach for a prayer meeting. It's a Friday night. I walk into a prayer meeting, the pastor's praying, three guys sleeping at the back door. Sleeping, that's what that. In the middle of the prayer. Pastor's my friend. I told him, don't introduce. Don't introduce. Just give me the microphone. He didn't understand why. So I grabbed the microphone. The minute I got it,
of that move. We cannot assume that we will be. We cannot live by presumption. Isn't that funny? You cannot, you don't presume naturally. Right? You know, a, a car salesman, if he doesn't sell cars, he's got no commission. <laughs> if you don't show up to work, you don't have a bonus. Can you imagine? You don't show up to work at the end of the year, you go up to your boss. Boss, my bonus. <laughs> and your boss says, the only thing I'm thinking of is firing you. Come on. Why? Because you haven't produced. <laughs> you haven't produced, but yet you want the audacity for something more. <gasps> if we do minimum, we cannot expect maximum. It does not work. Because it requires something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It requires. Right? Many of you fathers and mothers. I'm sure you wake up one morning and you say, Man, I don't feel like going to work today. I woke up in the morning and I said, Man, I don't feel like preaching today. It's not a choice. It's not a choice. Why? Because you have something called responsibility. Come on. That's all by you. You signed up for this. Are you with me? So what do you do? You shake off that feeling and say, I'm going to work. Why? Because I've got kids to feed. Hallelujah. I've got a family to take care of. Listen, what am I saying to you tonight? This is what I'm saying. You want to move for God. You got to increase your level. That's right. That's right. You cannot function at the old level and expect a visitation of God. It cannot come. It will not come. Unless we change our mindset. In First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Amasa, chief of the captains, and he said to David, We are yours, so David. We are on your side, O son of Jesse. Peace to you. Peace to your helpers. For your God helps you. So David received them and made them captains of his troop. Made them captains of his troop. It's very interesting. Why? Because what it shows us here is that these people learned to recognize that the move of God had shifted. They were still putting up with Saul. But they knew it has already shifted. Shack was great, but you know what? 
This is 2018. Amy's not coming back. Come on. We like history, but I don't want to be part of history. Why? Because God called us to make history. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus is making history. You know, on a side note, you know, sometimes when we organize our conference, people always ask me, you say, you always put history maker, not S. I always ask, you know, when I give it to someone else, they always organize it and they'll put S. And I always tell them this. I say, come on, don't put an S there. I say, what? I say, there's one only one history maker. There's only one history maker. My goal is to follow him. Hallelujah. Follow him. I be the shadow and he be the substance. That's my goal. As long as I learn to be the shadow and he be the substance, I will hit the target. I will hit the target. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 10 verse 9, it says a devout man who feared God with his household and gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Verse 3. And about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision the angel of God coming in and saying to him, Come this. About the ninth hour of the day. Not seventh hour, not eighth hour, the ninth hour. Come on. How can we be ready for the visitation of God? There are three groups of people who will miss God's visitation. There are three groups. The first group. John 1 verse 9. There was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own. Verse 11. His own did not receive him. They are in the world and they don't believe in God. Listen, this is the first group that will surely miss the visitation. Why? Because in them is not the capacity to believe who he is. Come on. He came and they did not recognize him. He walked among them, but they totally missed. Can you imagine? You know, the worst person I believe, okay? In Jesus' time, was Jesus' neighbor? Man. Can you imagine? 30 years, he was a carpenter. Next door neighbor. Right on judgment day. Amen. Our neighbor, he's on the throne. <laughs> can give you. After 30 years, if your eyes still don't open, shoot yourself. Is it 
20 minutes and say, okay, okay, 50 minutes we out. Praise God. Hallelujah. Come back and see. Be wonderful. You know what? 90% of U.S. churches are like that. There are a lot more people. Why? Because that's what people are looking for. Right. But you know what's the problem? They will never get their breakthrough. Never. Never get their breakthrough. You know what you will have? You will have a bulletin of all sick people. I've been to those churches. The bulletin is so thick because somebody is dying. And sometimes it's the pastor. <laughs> Come on. They miss the visitation of God because they do not believe. Number two, they miss the visitation of God. Luke chapter 17, verse 26, 27. It says it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given into marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Busy with activity but not conscious of heaven. They were caught up in the cycle of life. Come on, this is a second group of people. You know how many people are caught up in the cycle of life? Come on. You know, when, when Monday morning comes, somehow, even if they have a call, they will run to work. Right? If they are going to go for a holiday, it doesn't matter how they feel, when they'll get to the airport. Right? But when it comes to God, Last night, I'm not kidding, last night, okay, I went to bed about 2.30 in the morning, I woke up at 5. It really happened. Why? Because this is crap. Right? My body can rest when it needs to rest. I have a work to do. That's it. I have a work to do. Why? Because this is more important. Right. I don't care if there were three people today. I'll still preach the same. Mm. Mm. Why? Because right. my commitment is to him. It's to him. I go to places to say, oh, you know, it's been going on, you know, uh, there are people who need prayer. I say, I'll be here, no problem. I pray for people. Next morning. You say, oh, why do you push yourself? I push myself because he pushed himself. Yeah. What are you talking about? I only gave 10% of what he gave. Nothing compared to his sacrifice. Right. If we want a visitation of God, we got not to be stuck in the cycle of life. Our job is not a goal. It just pays bills. Come on. That's it. Man. Come on. Don't annoy your house. Walk around. Man, my house. Wow, wow. It's all going to go up and smoke. Are you with me? Come on. No matter how. Okay, you take care of this body. How much money you put in. Okay, when you all die, you all rot the same way. Yeah. doesn't matter what you apply. I'm not saying you don't have to take care of it. You can take care of it, but don't focus on it. You focus on your spirit. You focus on eternal things. Why? Because that's going to last. Hallelujah. Come on. Amen. Point number three. John chapter 9, verse 17 and 18. And they said to the blind man, What do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes, and he said, He is a prophet. Verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him. 
that he had been blind and received sight until they called his parents of him who had received his sight. Verse 19, they asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? And how then does he now see? Verse 20, his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and he was born blind. They saw the miracle right in front of their eyes. They have the facts, but they still did not believe. Why? Because they limited God's capacity. I like what Reinhard Bonke said one time. He said, he said, some of my meetings, some people get healed, some don't get healed. He said, there's only two reasons. Maybe it's because of my faith. Maybe it's because of their faith. But it's never because of God's word. <laughs> Come on. It's never because of who God is. Why some things don't happen. It's not because of God. It's because we miss something. Are you here? <laughs> they refuse to believe. They refuse to check the facts. Another very funny point here. John 7 verse 14. Therefore, many of the crowd they heard saying, Truly, this is a prophet. Verse 41, others said, This is Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Look at that. Because, you know, Jesus came out from Galilee. So they said, Oh, no, he's from Galilee. They did not even want to check the fact that he actually came out of the town that was prophesied. If you choose to believe, you will continue that way. No matter how much facts there are before you. Come on. How do you align yourself and never miss God's visitation? There are three points that I want to make in closing here. If you don't want to miss God's visitation, Number one, Luke chapter 25, verse 25. It says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and his name, he was just in the world, waiting for the consolation. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Number one, he was a seeker after God. If you want a visitation, you must maintain your heart. You know, isn't that interesting? Nobody needs to tell us to maintain our natural hunger. <laughs> Nobody needs to tell us. Right? Okay? If you miss dinner, I don't know about you, but if I miss dinner at 12 o'clock, I'm trying to sleep, my stomach is like, wake up, man. <laughs> I'm like, man, it's late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I open the refrigerator, and you know what? There's some stuff sitting there, <clears throat> maybe three days old. Who cares? <laughs> Eat it. I'm like, man, this is good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because I'm hungry. <coughs> Hungry to worship. I enjoy the worship. Hungry. You 
must stir yourself with that hunger. Refuse, deny your body. And say, no. Why? Because this is priority. The things of God is priority. Are you following me? That's good. Come on. When I was a young boy, you know, my mom had a habit. You don't pray, you don't eat. Man, our prayer might be very powerful. Very powerful. Because my mom, okay, strange thing about her, when she was not even a believer, she was a fanatic. When, she, when I was a Catholic baby, you know, my mom brought me to church every day. By the time I was six years old, I could repeat the prayer the priest prayed by memory. Why? I was there for six years. Every day, rain or shine. I know exactly. What he's going to do next. You create your hunger. You choose your choice. You know, today there are people sitting in this room that say, Oh, I like this thing. You decide. You decide. There are some things of this world, you know what? They're not important. But the presence of God is important. When it leaves, you know it left. When it's not there, you press in for more. Why? Because something is missing. If you want the visitation of God, you have to keep your hunger. Hallelujah. Number two. Same chapter, 25, verse 36. And now there was one Anna, a prophetess, daughter of Penuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and she lived with her husband seven years. And this woman was a widow and 84 years old who did not depart from the temple but served God with fasting and prayer and night and day. Number two, if you don't want to miss the visitation of God, you must be given to spiritual activity. You have to be deliberate about spiritual activity. Why? Because spiritual activity will align you with the visitation of God. Come on. You know one of the reasons why? I'm doing 10 conferences this year. You know I hate airplanes. says in the last days I will pour my spirit upon all flesh and your daughters shall prophesy listen I deliberately position myself with the move of God deliberate it's hard work it's a lot of work. Last year when I went to Europe, it was a lot of work. Why? Because we were doing the conference from ground up. Never done before. Never done before. Ground up. And you know what? On the first day, I said, Lord, how are you coming? Are you going to touch this continent? Okay, because if you're not, I don't want to be here. I don't want to waste my time. Next morning, I was so anxious at about 5 o'clock. I want to go down and see the people out there. I walked down at 5, 10, 5, 15, and there were young men sitting in the dark waiting for the door to open. Amen. All over the place. And the next day, there were pastors outside waiting. This is what it. This is what it. You are about to move. You are about to move. What 
we did a US conference only about 10, 15 days ago. Same question came up. Are the people going to come at 5.30? Because I have that as a requirement. In all our conferences, I said 5.30 early morning prayer. By the time you go back to the hotel and you go to bed, it's probably 1. Only at 1 o'clock. 5.30 you have to be at church. Yes. Just think you're going to pass this year. A place was packed. Packed with people from all over. What am I saying? There are people who are hungry for God. We just got to stick with the right crowd. Forget the sleepy heads. Run away from them. Get engaged with those that are busy about God's kingdom. Are you following me? If you don't want to miss the move of God, you've got to be involved in spiritual activity. Listen, after a certain time in spiritual activity, if you keep doing the same thing, even that thing will be born. Why? Because you're going to increase. One time somebody asked, Yongi Cho, Yongi Cho is the pastor of the largest church in the world about 10 years ago. Now, of course, their church is even bigger. He pastors a church of about 800,000 people. He asked him, Dr. Cho, what time do you wake up? He said, 3.30 in the morning. And I asked him, Dr. Cho, 3.30? What time do you go to bed? He said, about 12.30. He's over 80 years old. And I asked him, why do you wake up so early? You know what he said? I have 64,000 pastors under his leadership. 64,000. And he said, I have to pray for each one of them. speaker who knew the scripture well had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt he had taught the way of the Lord he taught others about Jesus with enthusiastic spirit with accuracy however he only knew about John's baptism verse 26 when Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue they took him aside and explained the way even more accurately point number three if you don't want to miss the move of God, be open-minded. Right. Last point. Be open-minded. Why? Because Jesus is not a franchise you can call on. Right. 
<laughs> Come on. Some people think they have cornered the Holy Ghost. Oh. They think that, oh, it's a franchise. It's only here. No, he's moving all over the world. He is moving in places you cannot imagine. You know, they did a documentary many years ago. It was fascinating. It's called A Ring of Fire. If you ever get a chance, go watch it. This group of guys, they travel around the world to study the, the platonic plates. <coughs> and they were in Indonesia. There's a lot of, you know, Indonesia sits on the plate. And they went into the deepest, deepest chapter. It took them about a month to get to this village. It was that remote. Can you imagine? Take a plane, take a boat, and then walk into the jungle. A man just to get there. So they get there, they see this tribe. So they're flipping this tribe and they're talking to them. They brought some translator, they're talking to them. And finally they ask them this one question. What do you all believe? And the tribal chief says, we believe in Jesus. Oh, and you should have seen the guy that was interviewing. He couldn't believe. He said, what? God for sacred place. These guys are half naked. He said, how on earth do they all know Jesus? God sent a man who showed us the way.
church. Don't be satisfied. I walk with the Lord for 42 years. And this is what I told the Lord. Lord, what I've seen, what I've known, what I've tasted is just a drop in the bucket. What you have known is way more than I can imagine. So what do I do? I clean my slate. Every day. Lord, make me more hungry. More desperate. 